Hello and welcome to this repair tutorial and today we're going to look at a Rotel and the model number is RA820AX. For general specifications the power output is 30 watts per channel into 8 ohms and this will increase up to 50 watts if you're going to connect a 4 ohm speaker load. Maximum impedance would be up to 16 ohms and you also have the ability to have remote speaker selection so when you look from the front panel right next to the headphone jack this is where if you spun the amplifier around you would see dual sets of speaker terminals and it's a nice feature if maybe you have another set of speakers in a different room and you want to select those and then bring the audio through. And then frequency response is 10 Hz up to 40 kHz and total harmonic distortion comes in at 0.08% and the amplifier has an input for a phono stage and this is integral so you don't need an external preamp or equalizer and it's for a moving magnet type cartridge and your input millivolts is 2.5 millivolts which is standard and input impedance again is standard at 47 kilo ohms and then for your line inputs you have auxiliary cd tuner and tape and input voltage there is 150 millivolts maximum into 20 kilo ohms now for the tape selection you choose that from the front fascia where you'll select between what we term as source all other inputs or tape the amplifier also has a quarter inch jack socket for headphone connection for personal listening but what you'll note is that it doesn't automatically disable the speakers when you operate the jack socket what is sort of unique on this amplifier and because of the ear of the amp it also has the ability to select mono so when you again from the front fascia you can select stereo mode or mono mode which is a nice feature as well as tone defeat if you wish to bypass the tone control circuits as always you have separate balance bass and treble controls and then overall dimensions the width of the amplifier is 444 millimeters depth is 303 with a height of 86 and weight is 6 kilograms now the build quality of this amplifier is very good all of the construction really is metal and that's nice because many modern day amplifiers use a lot more plastic than uh, probably what they should do what also as well is nice is when you turn the amplifier upside down what you'll see is there is a metal base plate the reason why i mention that some of the later rotel amplifiers they switch to a plastic plate and then put some aluminium foil on there for you know emi sort of radio suppression but what you found was that these plastic covers became brittle over time and started to crack and break so by keeping the metal one and it sort of signifies the build quality well, you'll also find that there is a grounding screw that connects through then to the main board. Just be careful of that. You know, if it does become loose, sometimes you can hear like a staticky type noise. So just make sure that, that screw is firmly in place and not loose. So let's sort of look at the issues affecting this amplifier. And it's really linked to age. What I did find, and you sort of see this now when you look from the top, the amplifier wasn't really dirty inside. You know, amplifiers are coming to the workshop sometimes you know, you've got to take a compressed air hose and spend a considerable amount of time clearing out dust and debris because of the large dissipation grills from the top cover but not in this case but what did become evident and when i sort of got into them was just sort of brushing it out and cleaning it through there was clearly signs that maybe the amplifier had been in a humid environment or slightly damp or maybe it had been stored in an attic but i'll sort of come back to what that caused as an issue a little bit later so in terms of strip down the amplifier then to get access it's quite straightforward yes there are multiple screws that you need to remove but you will be able to remove the front fascia but what i'd also say as well just take a little bit of caution when you remove the front fascia because you have the led which comes through for the power indication and it sort of clips in place so just make sure you disconnect that first off before you remove the fascia completely and then what i'm showing you here is the front of the amplifier with the fascia removed and then what you can see is the headphone jack and then what you do is you have like a slide clip puts that or locks that into position and then you'll have multiple screws on the different selection switches and then you can see the locking nuts then for the user controls once you've removed all of those what you'll be able to do is really take the side plates off and then you have the main board the small plate where the power transformer is mounted and then what you'll also see as well is the tone control board just be a little bit careful with the tone control board because with regard to the push buttons which are mounted onto there don't just just pull them you'll find that they're very very stiff to remove and if you just pull them then you could damage the switch locking mechanism so don't do that just use a flat blade screwdriver to prevent movement from the switches 
and then you can then remove the push buttons. Now, the first thing that I'm showing you is the speaker selection switch. And the reason why I'm showing you this is that the owner of the amplifier sent it in said, you know, there could be an issue with the remote set of speakers. But this work would have been carried out anyway. And what I'm showing is the switch removed and then it's then taken apart. So what you typically have to do and what was done with this amplifier is that every switch was removed and the slide contacts inside were cleaned with a fiberglass pencil and then also the slide or the, the switch connectors were also cleaned and then deoxid grease applied to ensure any further ex or to prevent any further oxidization but it's it's not a five minute task okay you know you're going to have to spend quite a reasonable amount of time removing these switches and the other added complication what Rotel do is they bend over a number of the pins of the switches which is a bit of a pain because these pins you can't bend multiple times probably two or three times maximum before they break off so what I would say to you is if you are doing this just take time to do it don't try and rush it and also as well what I do is I'll use a desolder pump to remove the solder around the vertical pins of the switches and for the ones which are bent over what I'll do is I'll use solder wick and that's what you see here in the uh, in the picture where you can see that the selection switch and you can see the solder wick now so for anybody who's not aware of what this product is you know we use it extensively in the repair of different electronic equipment what it is is it's copper braid and it's impregnated then with flux so the solder flows very very easily and it's, it's as different terms so you could have like solder wick you might call it solder braid or even solder mop and the idea is is that you press onto the pot that you want to desolder and then as the solder melts the, the solder then soaks into the braid and then away from the connection I use this on the pins that are bent over for multiple reasons. First one is that it reduces the mechanical stress on the board. And then also as well, it allows me then to put a small jeweler screwdriver underneath the connection or underneath the pin because the solder has been removed and just apply a small amount of heat, then I can move it up. What you don't really want to be doing is using maybe the tip of the solder on it, like a chisel to try and push it up because first off you could damage the circuit board but the other thing is that there may still be some solder remaining and the last thing you want to do is flick that solder up and maybe you weren't using eye protection or like in the case of my workbench my test equipment is directly you know behind it so I don't want to flick a blob of solder you know onto my multimeter or signal generator so just take the time and as I say you know it's it's a lot of time it is it's, it's not a five minute task so what I'm showing you know throughout sort of the conversation that I'm having now is just the different input selection switches and where I've taken them apart I've cleaned them and then applied as I said the deoxid grease and it's always a fiberglass pencil just avoid using anything more abrasive right don't go in there with sandpaper and think you know that'll be okay because these contacts you know should glide across the connection but but if you start using something more abrasive then you know it's not going to be a good outcome with regard to the the switches so once all that work was done i also am now showing you the tone control board because what the customer reported was that they didn't believe that the tone control circuit was working correctly but what you had is issues associated with the tone defeat switch so because it was resistive and also oxidized you could definitely hear changes around there you know it wasn't equal on either of the channels but once that switch was fully cleaned and reassembled the you know the to me the the tone control circuit was working very very well you could definitely see the bass on the lower frequencies and then the treble adjustment then on the higher frequencies but because of the age of the amp and it's common with all these types of amplifiers i also did a check on all of the capacitors so on the electrolytics you know they're high quality you know rubicon type capacitors so all electrolytics were then checked with the esr meter and no issues found all with intolerance no high esr and then i also checked the polyester capacitors the smaller value type ones again with an lcr meter and there was no issues found with any of the capacitors now the next thing that i want to sort of highlight and i'm sort of showing you again in the video is this amplifier doesn't have a speaker protection relay circuit and what I mean is the circuit where when you power up the amplifier it will take about five seconds providing there's no fault 
for the speaker protection relay to change over and then connect the audio to the external speakers. Now this is used for two reasons. First of all you don't get this thump of DC as the rail capacitors charge up so it's a better user experience. And then when you depower, same thing, you don't hear noise through the speakers as the capacitors discharge because the relay de-energizes straight away and disconnects. But in terms of a protection circuit, if maybe you add excess DC on the output, then the speaker protection circuit again would operate and the relay would then de-energize to prevent any damage. In this design, and this isn't unique, you see other amplifiers of this era, what the manufacturers have are fuses. So these are 4 amp and they clip into the board into these fuse carriers as I'm highlighting here. Now what you found with this amp was that if you ran it on test and you connected your headphones the audio quality would be good. It didn't have any issues, no distortion, nothing. But as soon as you connected external speakers what you then found is that you had intermittent loss then of the right channel. When you got the audio signal tracer what was really interesting is at one end of the fuse, the audio was crystal clear with no distortion. But then when you went to the other end of the fuse, what you found was that the audio was intermittent. Sometimes it would come and go, but it was very distorted. So this is common like if you had a speaker protection relay because of oxidization on the switching contacts. So following the same thought, what I found was it wasn't a case that the fuse, and I've mentioned this on other tutorials, was loose inside the carrier. When you remove the fuses, what you then found was there was like green contamination and that was the issue. So it had grown around the cradle, the fuse holder, and then around also the fuse. Now I had really two courses of action. I could have removed the fuse and you know cleaned up the fuse ends and then maybe you know the fuse carrier where it clipped in. But what I'm showing now are brand new fuse carriers which have been put in and these are a better quality because they completely grip the end of the fuse rather than just the side edges and then once the amplifier again was run on test what you found was that the audio quality was crystal clear and there was no issues so this is this point that I mentioned right at the beginning of the tutorial I suspect this amp could have been in an environment where it was humid, damp or maybe it had been stored in an attic but there was definitely something amiss, you know, with this sort of uh, oxidization stroke, sort of uh, greenish mold. That's probably the word I'm going to use there. So once that was done, of course, the next part, and again, what I'm showing you, is the adjustment of the bias. Now, on the amplifier, you have two bias potentiometers. And what I show you now is the circuit schematic. And then what you can see here is... It refers to two test points. Now the test points don't appear to be shown on the schematic but they are clearly shown on the circuit board and this is where you will connect your multimeter test leads and again use hook clips to do that. Don't try and balance your multimeter leads onto there or your probes. And then what you're looking to do here is to set your volume control to minimum your balance, treble and bass controls to midpoint with no signal input connection and then you allow the amplifier for about 15 to 20 minutes just to stabilise. And then what you have to do is you have to do adjust the bias via the relevant trimmer. So in this case for this channel you can see that it is the bias potentiometer VR602 and this is a 22k. Now with this amp there wasn't really a huge offset you know it was nominally about four millivolts anyway on both of the channels so there was no concern so no real sort of adjustment but you can also see here as well you have the fuse which is the four amp fuse there which is the protection fuse and then i've mentioned this multiple times before if you have maybe excess dc on the rear terminals and for this amplifier there wasn't if you put your meter on both the right and the left channel speaker terminals it was nominally just a few millivolts but if it went excessively high then what you need to do then is you need to look at Q602 and 604 so these are what we call long tail pair and this way it's connecting them from the common emitters and over time what you can find is that the HFE or the gain of these transistors drift out which would result then in a bias up or a bias down as a DC offset. So you wouldn't be concentrating the rest of the amplifier unless it was significantly high, like 1.6 volts or something like that. But if it's maybe three or 400 millivolts more, then you know, look at the input stage of the amp. 
And then you can also just briefly see on the left hand side, these are the mechanical switches, which again from the selection from the input where you're selecting maybe stereo mode or mono mode. So the other thing which was also carried out was the cleaning of the user control potentiometers. So again, this is common practice. And the other thing that I'm showing you next is the underneath of the circuit board. So this is the solder side and you need to scan that board to identify if there are any dry solder joints. And you will always find this. It's not something which is born from manufacture. It's just over time heated components and you get a breakdown of solder connections. So scan that and just reflow any of those dry joints. And um, what I'm highlighting next is a multi-pin ribbon connector which connects onto the main board and then up to one of the other boards where it connects the signal through. And what I'm highlighting now are multiple dry solder joints. So once all those were reflowed, I also defluxed the board as well with flux remover, cleaned it all up and then it just went through final test. No issues whatsoever, you know, perfect operation. But not a complicated repair, but quite a time consuming one. If you are looking to service this particular make or model, you know, if you follow along with this, you know, there was only sort of blown components, as we said. You know, if you follow the routine that I've just described here, you know, there's no sort of concern. You should be able to restore the amplifier back and it should deliver to you, you know, many years of high quality sound. So, as always, I appreciate you stopping by and listening to this tutorial. And if you have any questions or you need any further information about any aspect of amplifier servicing, by all means email audioamplifierservicing at aol.com and I'll be more than happy to come back to you and provide any guidance, assistance or support. So until the next time, I wish you all the very best. Cheers and bye bye.